Well, good morning. It's my privilege to be able to introduce our faculty speaker for this ceremony. But before doing so, let me say just a few words of thanks. I thank our musicians, the drum corps, the symphonic wind ensemble, under the leadership of Danny Helseth. I thanks to David Anderson for leading us in singing. I thank our incredible facilities crew for setting all of this up. I want to give a shout out to Michelle McFarland and her whole team for coordinating the logistics of this event and the commencements that follows. And I want to thank God for the weather. <laughs> it's my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Brian Chin. Dr. Chin is the Associate Professor of Music here. He's been on our faculty joining us in 2001, which I might add was a good year for SPU. He serves as Director of Instrumental Studies and Coordinator of Music Theory. He teaches many of the core music degree classes, including freshman oral skills and advanced music theory. He also directs our very innovative Learning Assistant Program, which is actually helping to redefine the way music is taught in higher education. As an international trumpet soloist and advocate for new music, Dr. Chin has commissioned and premiered many works for trumpet. He serves as principal trumpet for the Tacoma Symphony Orchestra. He records for film studio projects, performs regularly with the Seattle Symphony Orchestra, the Seattle Opera Orchestra. He has two solo recordings entitled Universal Language and Eventide. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brian Chin. To President Martin, Provost Van Duzer, members of the board, the esteemed and good-looking faculty of Seattle Pacific University, <laughs> and to the students and family of the graduating class of 2016, I am deeply honored for this privilege of speaking here today. I'm grateful for this opportunity and recognize the gravity of this moment. To the students graduating today, congratulations. You have made it, you've worked hard, engaged your brain, nurtured your spirit, and persevered as you jumped through the hoops. It is beautiful to stop and celebrate your achievements and to mark your accomplishment in ceremony. This ceremony symbolically cuts you free and sends you fearlessly off, cuts you free from that umbilical cord of the ivory tower to go do good work and to change the world. The reality of the situation, of course, is that today doesn't mark the end of anything, but the moment when your real work is beginning. And it can be terrifying, especially without a manual or syllabus with clear rubrics for determining success, <laughs> or a roadmap for navigating a full and engaged life. What I would like to share with you today is a conclusion and a realization that I have come to in my own life and through my research. I'm going to share with you what I think is an extremely powerful tool in creating success in your life and living a life of purpose. This is a tool that each and every one of us possess. And when it comes down to it, we have all been using it all of our lives. This is a tool that I hope to inspire you to begin a practice of, to learn to utilize this tool as a motivator, a relationship builder, a spiritual guide, a compass for morality, and a metric for success. Think about what the following people have in common. Tiger Woods, Mozart, Prince, Russell Wilson, Kevin Spacey, and Wayne Gretzky. They all have... <laughs> ridiculous amounts of seemingly natural and gifted superhuman talent. Those of you who have worked with me over the years know that I am obsessed with the concept of talent. Where does this ability come from? How do we get more of it? How can we learn to develop our talents? The brain research of the past decades has led to massive discoveries on how we learn and develop skill, and for the first time enable us to understand talent on a deep level. That ultimately, we have the ability to develop our own talent. We now know how it works. The idea of natural born God-given talent 
has actually been legitimately challenged. Yet, talent certainly exists. We see it every day in the work of our majors from the art department, the concert hall, the theater stage. We see it on the basketball court in Royal Brown, the successful businesses of our alumni, and in the classrooms across campus. And we have all seen that eight-year-old kid on the soccer field who dominates the competition with ease and with joy. The 10,000 hours of mastery role of Malcolm Gladwell and others has largely been accepted into the general culture ethos of learning, but it needs to have the following caveat. It needs to be 10,000 hours of deep learning. What does it mean to have deep learning, really deep learning? I know that Peyton Manning himself could teach me to throw a perfect spiral and I could practice football for 10,000 hours and while I would get better, I guarantee that I would not be a world-class football player. The same thing would happen if I took financial lessons with Alan Greenspan or I studied law and politics with Barack Obama. Now, is this because God did not give me the gifts that I would need to succeed in these arenas? Perhaps. But mostly, it's because I don't care. <laughs> I can't see myself doing any of those things on a world-class level. My ability to really see myself succeeding brings a subtle shift to this deep learning concept that changes everything about the way we engage with our lives and find meaning and purpose. Wayne Gretzky, for those of you who don't know, is commonly regarded as the most talented hockey player the world has ever known, capable of seemingly magical moves on the ice. His parents tell of two-year-old little Wayne crying whenever the hockey game on the TV was changed. Later, he talked about his obsession with visualizing the puck flying around the ice and imagining new ways to manipulate the puck into the net. Michael Jordan used to visualize in real time performing a complete and idealized game before going out to the court and finding the zone, as he would call it. Later, he would describe the funny sensation of not knowing the difference between what he had imagined over the years and what was real. The famous hotel tycoon, Conrad Hilton, used to play hotel manager as a kid and would imagine every detail of an ideal hotel experience from the perspective of his future guests. James Levine, the famous conductor of the Metropolitan Opera, used to imagine and build opera sets for famous scenes in shoeboxes as a seven-year-old. And as a young kid, I used to build imaginary musical instruments. And embarrassingly, I confess that I used to design curriculums for imaginary art schools. The one thing that is clear about talent is that it requires deep learning. And deep learning requires the secret sauce, imagination. We all have it. We all know it is there. And I'm not just talking about unicorns, rainbows, and lightsabers. As upstanding adults, we are generally not encouraged to indulge in childish fantasies, but still, we use this gift every day. We visualize ourselves in situations professional, social, intimate, and in play. We use our imagination to make the most of the thousand daily choices, like what to eat or what addictions to indulge in, as well as the major life decisions, like what work we will engage in and what relationships we will build. The problem is, that most of the time, we do this in a reactionary and worrying way that keeps us from engaging, produces decisions rooted in fear, and creates tension in relationships in our community. For the most part, we as a culture have steered away from developing our gift of imagination as a proactive, effective, and positive tool for real use in business, life, and in community. To be clear, I'm not just talking about greatness in exceptional cases of demonstrable talent. I'm talking about the ability for all of us to fully engage with the world and the people around us and to lead lives of exceptional purpose. With this metric for success, we simply cannot fail. But the thing about imagination is that it's like a muscle that can be strengthened or atrophied. Within us lies God's deep and powerful tool that for the most part has not been fully developed or fully utilized. 
Of course, I come to you from my background in the arts, where imagination is at least encouraged from time to time. But this affects all of us and all of our disciplines, and has the potential to legitimately change our lives and hence the world. Here are only a few ideas that I humbly submit to you day, today to strengthen this imagination muscle. Number one, practice. Practice is ultimately more than a means to perfecting a skill or honing your craft. Practice is an ongoing and conscious decision on how you want to live your life. Practice is an ongoing and conscious decision on how you want to live your life. You can practice yoga, and we have spiritual practices, knowing that these are ongoing, lifelong pursuits. One of the ways that we can empower our gift of imagination is to practice it. Try this 10 ideas exercise that I stole from our business folks down the street. Simply force yourself to write down 10 ideas about anything every day during breakfast. You are likely to get one good idea every so often, and this simple act of active brainstorming can create amazing change in your life. Number two, consume less, make more. We live in a time where I have all of the world's cumulative knowledge easily accessible from the phone in my pocket. In the age of YouTube, Netflix, Spotify, Kindle, ESPN, and Facebook, why would anybody ever need to create anything else? It is easy to fall into the next video game, or the next show to binge on, or the tyranny of the next urgent email. Instead, start making more stuff. Good food, good conversation. Develop your craft, write down your ideas, help a neighbor, learn an instrument, create for the sake of creating. Consume less, make more. Number three, ask the right questions every day. This is where your critical thinking training comes in. Rather than thinking, why am I not happy? Why is that person out to get me? Why does my partner always, why don't I ever have time to? Start asking, what would happen if I? How can I better help create a scenario for those around me to flourish? Can I see it? Can I imagine it? What world of peace and cultural reconciliation, what would that world actually look like? Can we see it? What world do I want to leave for my children? If we all start to ask the right questions and engage our collective imaginations, amazing things and positive changes will happen. Look to your left. Actually, do it. I know that's rhetoric, but look to your left. Look to your right, behind you, all of us, right? These are the people that will change the world with you. I am convinced on a thousand different levels that imagination is the key. Ultimately, the question evolves from what can you imagine to what can we imagine?